Tonight, the international scramble to escape Sudan's civil war as the situation becomes more volatile and dangerous. A failed ceasefire. The lack of communication. It would be really nice that somebody at least got in touch with us once, right? Foreign nationals desperate to flee. It's very difficult for them to feel safe and secure in terms of even going to the airport or a landing field. Accusations of brutality against police. This was uncalled for, it was unjust, it was barbaric, and it was, it was just criminal. After an indigenous man is tasered and beaten. Plus, Australia's greatest maritime mystery solved. I can now confirm that the SS Montevideo Maru has now been found. 80 years after it was torpedoed with more than a thousand POWs on board. CTV National News with Sandy Ronaldo. Good evening. As the second week of bloody civil infighting engulfs the African nation of Sudan, plans to rescue foreign citizens have taken on a new urgency. Countries like Britain, China and France are scrambling to get their diplomats to safety. The U.S. reportedly has just spirited its embassy staff and families out of the country on six aircraft. With a fragile ceasefire broken, the Sudanese army is promising to help others escape. But Canadians in Sudan are still in limbo, some telling CTV News they are unaware of any escape plans and are sheltering in place as they've been told by Global Affairs. As CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports, the situation is becoming more desperate by the hour. The thundering crack of explosions and gunfire echoed the streets of Khartoum as hope for the latest ceasefire crumbles. This Sudanese general accuses opposing paramilitary forces of breaching the truce before it even started. Despite escalating violence, the Sudanese army is promising to help get foreign nationals out. Saudi Arabia managed to help around 150 of its citizens escape by sea today, but other countries hoping to airlift stranded diplomats could face problems. Intense fighting has closed Khartoum's airport, raising doubts it could be used as an exit point. Foreigners are living in the capital city, uh, and it's very difficult for them uh, to feel safe and secure in terms of even going to the airport or a landing field. Canadians stuck in Sudan have been sending out videos like this documenting the violence. It's extremely scary. You know what? So we are facing... Um, uh, situation that is changing in every hour. Vesna Sikovic is a Bosnian war survivor teaching in Sudan. She's one of more than 1,500 Canadians surrounded by danger, looking for answers from Canada with the embassy in Khartoum closed. It would be really nice that somebody at least got in touch with us once, right? to what the other country is doing for their citizens. The government sending out this warning again for Canadians in Sudan to shelter in place with airports and the airspace closed. Air evacuations are not possible at this time. More than 400 people have been killed so far and the United Nations warns a lack of food, water and medicine is creating a humanitarian catastrophe. The Sudanese Canadian community is calling on Ottawa to create a special program, Sandy, to help sponsor family members stuck in Sudan. Okay, Kevin, thank you. Now on the other side of Africa, a triple suicide bombing near an airport and a military camp housing local troops, UN peacekeepers and Russian fighters with the Wagner Group. Dozens of homes and buildings were destroyed. No one has claimed responsibility for the attacks that killed at least nine people and injured well over 60. The family of a First Nations man on life support after a violent interaction with police in Prince Albert three weeks ago today is calling for accountability and justice. Bowden Umfreville was tasered multiple times in what his relatives say was a case of police brutality and racism. CTV's Bill Fortier reports. 
Get out of the car! Get out now! Get out! You're gonna get tased! Get out now! Cell phone video shows several warnings from Prince Albert police in the early morning hours of April 1st. Tase him! Then officers tased 40-year-old Bowden Umferville multiple times. The car he's driving ran into a police vehicle before Umferville was pulled from the car. Saskatchewan's police watchdog says batons and pepper spray were also used and that a gun was found at the scene. Three weeks later, Umferville remains in hospital on life support. I'm so sad, my heart's broken for my son. Umferville's family accused police of excessive force and racism against the indigenous father of five. My brother never deserved any of this. No human being deserved what my brother went through. This was uncalled for, it was unjust, it was barbaric, and it was, it was, it was just criminal. It's difficult with that video from that distance. But this criminologist says it appears the level of force was warranted. From what I can see, they did what they should do. It's a very dangerous situation they were in. Police say the owner of the car reported it stolen, even though they were in the car at the time. Saskatchewan's Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations is condemning the police response. It shatters the confidence of all of the of the uh, the officers, uh, good and, and not so good. Family members allege police did not attempt to revive Umfreville after his heart stopped beating. They're now demanding consequences. I don't know why. why? Badges aren't taken from them. The Prince Albert Police Service says all nine officers are back on the job. Saskatchewan's Serious Incident Response Team is investigating the actions of police. Sandy. CTV's Bill Fortier, thank you. The family of a B.C. man who died after being tasered by police has filed a lawsuit against the RCMP. There's absolutely no closure. Every day when I get up, I think about that. Like, what happened to you? In October 2019, Clayton Donnelly was pulled over by police in Kamloops who claimed he was driving erratically. The 38-year-old was tasered before going into cardiac arrest. BC's police watchdog investigated but never shared the findings with Donnelly's family. They hope a civil lawsuit will force police to reveal details of the arrest. No deal yet in the public service strike with both sides accusing the other of refusing to budge. Today, the union representing tens of thousands didn't mince words, pointedly blaming Ottawa for the stalemate. CTV's Natalie Van Roy reports. What kind of power? On the fourth day of a national strike with thousands picketing at more than 250 locations across the country, <laughs> federal workers taking a break from the line. It's unusual um, in this case that PSAC isn't, um, doesn't have picketing over the weekend um, because they lose that leverage. They lose that ability to convey their message to voters. Yeah, I get to Negotiations are still happening. Workers are calling for wage increases, better job security and remote work. The union wants a raise of 13.5% over three years. The government has offered 9%. I'm not going to let them wear us down. Both sides pointing blame for the slow pace. We are discussing remote work at the table. In order for us to reach a deal, the employer's got to start responding to some of these demands. The head of the union accusing the federal government of failing to respond to a new offer tabled Thursday night. I've never seen a round of bargaining like this. The disrespect at the table from Treasury Board and from this government. Treasury Board President Mona Forte's office responding Saturday, saying they've been at the bargaining table every day since mediation started, that they did respond to present a new offer, and the union was no longer available to meet, going on to say we are not here to play games, and that talks have resumed. The strike is causing a disruption of many services, including passport applications, immigration applications, and tax returns. I can't get my... Uh my passport updated and I'm due October. So yeah, that's going to be a problem. Forche said she's confident a deal will be reached as contract talks were set to go on. Natalie Van Roy, CTV News, Ottawa. One day after the U.S. Supreme Court preserved access to a widely used abortion pill, rejecting decisions by a lower court, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau reaffirmed his stance on abortion. This government will never tell a woman what to do with her body. We are unequivocally and proudly pro-choice and always will be. 
Justin Trudeau was recently confronted by a dissenter while visiting the University of Manitoba. You are, you are, you are not in favor of saying yes. A woman who was raped should get uh, should be able to choose uh, to not bear that child. Uh, I honestly don't know. Well, it sounds like you need to do a little more. Thinking. Yeah. Ottawa has offered to make the pill available to American women if it is banned. An update for you now on a disturbing night for a small community south of Montreal. Two men are in hospital after their plane plunged from the sky and crashed into two homes. CTV's Max Harrell joins us now to share what's known and the questions still unanswered. Max? A bleak scene in saint Remy at the home where the plane crashed and burned. This is what was left of their small plane after it crashed into two homes in an area full of fields about 7.30 Friday night. The aircraft crashed into one home, then struck some hydro lines before crashing into a second home. And although the two occupants of the plane were critically injured, there was no other injury, since nobody was in those homes at the time of the crash, and residents said there was a huge noise, followed by a cascade of falling electrical wires. One neighbor told CTV it was chaotic in the moments after the crash. We are bang, that's it, it's a fire. Fait que tous les voisins ont couru pour s'en venir ici. J'ai tout hébergé tout le monde des alentours. Parce que c'était dangereux, les fils électriques et tout, là. And reportedly, the whole thing could have been much worse because there was an outdoor gathering not far from the crash site. With everyone scrambling to safety indoors and away from those live electrical wires left dangling after the aircraft hit them. The SQ removed the broken plane from the site Saturday morning and said it is cooperating with the Transportation Safety Board. Max Harold, CTV News, Montreal. An announcement today from the Government of Australia. Closure on a mystery more than 80 years old. Officials were aware a ship carrying prisoners of war was sunk by U.S. torpedoes. What they didn't know was where the vessel ended up. Now they do. SCTV's Tom Walters explains. For deep-sea explorers, a muted celebration. They have just succeeded in finding a mass grave. A discovery of national importance in Australia announced today by the country's Deputy Prime Minister. I can now confirm that the SS Montevideo Maru has now been found. In the Second World War, after Japan invaded New Guinea, more than a thousand captured soldiers and civilians, almost all of them Australian, were put on the Montevideo Maru for transport. But with no idea there were Allied prisoners on board, the crew of this American submarine torpedoed the Japanese ship. This tragedy saw the single biggest loss of life of Australians at sea in our history. It was not until after the war that the Australians learned what happened and held a memorial. But the final resting place of the dead has remained a mystery. The absence of a location of the Montevideo Maru has represented unfinished business for the families of those who lost their lives until now. Now, after years of planning, searchers using this underwater robot started combing the seabed earlier this month. And there it was. On the 12th day of looking, an image strikingly clear. It was in two parts, the bow and the stern, 500 meters apart. Near the Philippines, in water more than 4,000 meters deep, a resolution at last for victims' families. We've been getting so much feedback from hundreds and hundreds of descendants today on our various Facebook pages and things like that. Tears. A nation's loss now found. No remains or artifacts will be removed from the ship. Officials say it will be left undisturbed as the tomb of more than 1,000 war dead. Sandy? CTV's Tom Walters. Well, Barry Humphreys has died. His name is likely not as familiar to Canadians as the character he created, the garish, snobby, but lovable Dame Edna Everidge. People keep saying they were tickled to bits to see me back on TV. <laughs> and people said, you really tickled our family's fancy. The enduring lady delighted audiences for 70 years and came about after Humphreys first dropped out of law school and then tried his own hand at acting. The master comedian died from complications following hip surgery. He was 89. Coming up after the break. It's not just affecting the lungs. The unexpected side effect of COVID. Plus, an English soccer team kicks it up a notch thanks to a Canadian A-lister.
calls for action on cleaning up the environment were at the forefront of this year's annual Earth Day in cities across Canada and around the world. In Halifax, participants wore animal costumes and masks to symbolize endangered species. Thousands marched outside London's parliament, hundreds lying down as part of a die-in protest. I'm going to clean up the trash today so the earth can be happy. And in the U.S., the young learning the importance of this 70-year tradition. Well, 20 percent. That's what a team of B.C. researchers says is the increased risk level of developing diabetes for those who've had COVID-19, something that will have significant health care implications. CTV's Penny Daflos explains. It's not something you can see, but our population is at higher risk from various health issues now that COVID is in our lives and impacting our bodies. BC researchers have confirmed people who got COVID in the first two years of the pandemic had a 15 to 20 percent higher risk of type 2 diabetes. It's not just affecting the lungs. We know that it can lead to heart disease. We know that people who have post-COVID syndromes um, have things like neurological issues. They have uh, fatigue and brain fog. And some some of the other things that we have seen um, are related to things like diabetes. Those who are younger, fitter, had a milder illness or are women had only slightly increased risk after becoming infected. We should be concerned. It's not a panic attack, but it means that this is a significant condition that puts people at risk having diabetes. This prominent American researcher agrees with the report authors that doctors should be very aware of the increased risk. Everybody who manifests symptoms of long COVID, at least this should be considered as one of the possible um, explanations. There's little debate now that the virus can have a long-term impact. You can start thinking about getting COVID almost as an accelerant to aging. Federal researchers believe up to 20% of Canadians have long COVID symptoms. We still have a lot we don't know. We still have a lot of people getting infected. And by no means are we done with the pandemic. We're done with waves, but not the pandemic. And that has health officials across the country scrambling to meet Canadians' growing medical needs. It's been hard, but we are increasing, you know, the number of uh, workers in the healthcare sector um, to account for not only the effects of COVID, which was going to be with us as a respiratory virus for the near future anyway, but also catching up on surgeries, screening for certain uh, cancers. Penny Daflos, CTV News, Vancouver. As we head to break, big smiles for Canadian actor Ryan Reynolds, whose investment in an underdog soccer team from Wales is reaping rewards. Champions! Rexham are promoted! The football club is now a force to be reckoned with, today winning a National League title. The victory promoted them to the next level. Reynolds has made billions through astute business investments from cell phones to spirits. He's also shown interest in buying the NHL's Ottawa Senators. Still ahead, empowering underrepresented artists with an auction of iconic portraits. A prized collection of Andy Warhol prints is going up for sale. Four signature portraits of late Queen will be auctioned off at the Winnipeg Art Gallery, and the plan is to use the proceeds to purchase new works by Indigenous artists. Here's CTV's Taylor Brock. Blake Anjkinib is best known for his contemporary Indigenous art. He's one of the few First Nations artists who make a living from their work. It's our culture, and it's like, uh, I just love seeing support, and. That's the best way to support Indigenous artists and by buying their work. That's what the Winnipeg Art Gallery is looking to do. One percent of our entire collection is dedicated to First Nations and Métis art. So there's a huge missing component and here we are in Winnipeg. Stephen Boris, the CEO of the WAG, says to raise the money to do that, it's selling four Andy Warhol prints of Queen Elizabeth, a series called Reigning Queens. He's hoping the art auction will raise a million dollars. The fact that those works will generate a significant dollar to allow us to buy contemporary Indigenous art, for me, is incredibly powerful. The symbolism of the Queen going out its doors and Indigenous art coming in is not lost on Boris. We do know the association of the monarchy with colonization and oppression and other things. 
Selena Warhol, that's of the Queen. It's moving away from art that represents the monarchy and colonization and replacing it with indigenous artwork. It's bringing hope to Anjknep. I love it. It just shows uh, the way is taking a step in the direction of promoting indigenous artists and uh, representing the society and the community better. That step paints a picture of the future Anjknep hopes to see for indigenous artists. Just everybody uh, creating as they will in sharing each other's culture and respecting each other and just creating beautiful artwork for people to enjoy. Taylor Brock, CTV News, Winnipeg. After the break, the message. I want everyone to know our world isn't okay and we need to stand up for it. And what this preteen did to make a difference. We leave you tonight with the story of an 11 year old many are calling inspirational. She started with a simple idea that has the potential to inspire big change. Here's CTV's Adam Swatsky. Well, Avery Stepanak had watched nature documentaries with her mom before, this time felt different. I was sad because like our earth, like there was fires going on, the ice was melting. While many might feel overwhelmed or hopeless, this 11 year old felt curious. And I was like, what can I do? A question her mom, Lisa, had heard before. She has a can-do spirit. Like when Avery learned that a lot of animals weren't as lucky as hers, she used her birthday money to donate to the SPCA. Or when her grandma was battling cancer, she sold lemonade to raise money for research. And she likes to do something good for the world. So when she learned about the state of the world, Avery wrote a list of things she could do to improve it which included making a couple posters about the environment and asking her grade five teacher if they could be hung in the classroom. I thought that was really inspirational that a child has these big ideas. Mr. Barker says Avery's list of ideas also included the creation of some sort of environmental club. I want everyone to know our world isn't okay and we need to stand up for it. So Avery started brainstorming ideas about the club with her mom before getting approval from the principal at Pexasen Elementary, enlisting members over the morning announcements and launching weekly meetings. And she is just a natural leader. I'm so excited to have you all here again. Avery and her team are committed to achieving weekly goals from making organic compostable bird feeders to creating posters about threatened animals in the hallways, to picking up garbage around the school grounds. Well, I hope people are inspired to do more of what like we do in a day. Because if we want to make a better tomorrow for young people, Avery says, all people need to do something tangible today. It's not gonna get any better unless we change. Adam Swatsky, CTV News, Langford. And that's our newscast for this Saturday. Thank you for sharing your time with us. I'm Sandy Ronaldo. Good night. Until tomorrow. Bye for now.